Okay, we are here today to hear from our speaker, Kevin Woods, and it's my pleasure to introduce him to you. Kevin's a Texas City boy. Uh, he, after 9-11, he decided to join the U.S. Navy, and he served five years as an aircraft firefighter on the flight deck of the USS John C. Stennis for two deployments. He's also a good friend, very good friend, of one of our friends here, J.P. Lane. You remember J.P. spoke a couple years ago? That's one of Kevin's buddies. And uh, he's, uh, I've been talking to J.P. He, he's, uh, he, he may be coming back to, uh, to listen in on a meeting here with us soon, so I'd like to hear that. When he returned home, from his deployments, he began self-medicating with alcohol, attempted suicide three times. And he believes that going to jail after being arrested for intoxicated assault was a turning point in his life and one of his greatest blessings. He had always run away from God when things, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, when things were good, but when things got bad, of course, like so many of us run right, right to God then when, when things aren't going so well. But now he realizes that he needs to run with Jesus instead of away from him. He began a sober lifestyle on December 21, 2016. And he then worked in the veteran treatment courts, recruiting, training, and assisting mentors for veterans. And then he worked, for part, uh, worked as a partnerships coordinator for the Phoenix, which is a sober active community nonprofit. And he tells me he just uh, changed jobs. He's now with Harris County. He'll tell you about that. And he and his beautiful wife, Allie, have a young son named Rex. And it's my pleasure to give you Kevin Woods. <sighs> he drinks like a sailor. Or there was always that story. Remember when we pulled into said port like Singapore? The first thing I'd always say is, yeah, I remember that port. But that's the only thing I remember is pulling in because Chances were I was, not even chances, I was going out and I was going to explore what they had inside of every single bar that I was able to get into. Uh, like many of us, I joined at the age of 19, so whenever we went overseas, we got to drink underneath that country's law, which for someone coming from the U.S., having to wait till 21, what do you do? <laughs> you go party and have some fun. And that's one of the regrets that I had while I was in the service. Uh, just like the, the Navy, there's... It, Drinking is the military culture that is instilled in most of us, which I'm sure a lot of the vets here can can agree with, that you drink in the good, you drink in the bad, and every party, every party starts with one sip of alcohol, and we're going to go all night long. I will say the Navy probably drinks better than the Army, just saying. Not, to, not something to be too proud of, but it's something. Uh, ever since I was a little kid, my grandfather was my hero. I wanted to do and be everything just like he was. Uh, career day, book character day, uh, hero day, whatever the day was, if I had an opportunity to put on that Class A service uniform. Any Marines here? Good, so everyone's going to understand what I'm saying. Uh, so uh, so I'd always wear, wear his uniform and, and felt like I was the biggest, toughest kid in, in school because I had my grandfather's uniform on that he wore in Korea, and I thought, hey, this is what I was going to be. And September 11th happened when I was in seventh grade, and like many other service members, that was the day that I decided that I was actually going to go in and I was going to serve our country. At that time, I didn't know what a terrorist attack was. Uh, it's not something that we talked a lot about in school, and it, it wasn't in, in our forefront. So right after I turned 18, I showed up at home, Sat my parents down at the table. They thought I got in trouble, but I didn't. So they were happy at that moment until I said, I am leaving on October 4th, 2007, and I'm going into the Navy. Of course, they were proud until they asked what my job was. And I said, I haven't gotten that far yet. I just said, I'm going in and signed some papers. It was, it was a turning point in my life. As it was mentioned, I was one of those ones growing up that you know would run to God when when things are bad. And if I'm going to be honest with you today, I'm still that still that person. Uh, I think everyone struggles with that at, at some time in their life, mostly every day, like myself. I was born and raised Catholic, 
I got my communion, confirmation one, confirmation two, got confirmed Catholic, and my mom said, it is now your choice to either go to church, find a new church, or carve your own path. Luckily, it was instilled in me that God needed to be in my life one way, shape, or form, and I was surrounded by some, some decent people in high school that their parents still made them go to church, so I got to uh, experience different churches. There's one church in, per in particular I got to experience, and I don't know if y'all he heard of a guy named Jeremy Camp. Anybody heard that name before? Our uh, youth pastor at that church ended up being really good friends with them back before no one knew what Jeremy Camp was. They just thought it was a campsite. Um, so we got a private acoustic performance by him. We had a band come in from Hawaii, which was cool, you know, seeing the surfer guys down there near Galveston and uh, hanging out with them. So he was one of those pastors that would uh, kind of feel like – like he understood you, he, he knew where you were from and he wasn't trying to like talk down on you or anything like that. He wanted to speak with you at your level and show you the, the, the way the way to God. In boot camp, I continued my journey. I don't know if uh, the other branches have holiday routine, but we had a thing called holiday routine. And in boot camp, that is you wake up about an hour later than, than normal and you get a couple hours to either write home to your loved ones or shine your boots, get your, your uniform ready, or you could escape the department where you slept at and go to church. So you, you can imagine how packed that church service was that we were able to get a little bit of freedom from people yelling at us. So God was doing some work there, there while we were in boot camp. When it came time for me to get out, I thought I was ready, uh, like many of us. You want that freedom. You want that overtime. Well, my second deployment, we did 42 days straight of 18-hour days. And at that time, I was making about $800 a paycheck. So you can imagine how much an hour I was working at that time. So I wanted to get out. I wanted to chase that oil field money, just like everybody in Texas does. And I wanted to have a family. Out of the five years that I was in, I was away from a port for over three and a half years. So trying to have a family was not feasible to, to, to my, my thought process at the time. But little did I know, I was not ready to get out. At the time, they make you go through a, a TAPS class where they talk to you about transitioning out. I remember that instructor saying, if you want a job, do not put any disability on your paperwork when you get out, or you're going to have a hard time getting a job. So when it came time to check out, to go to medical, I was perfectly fine. I didn't have any back injuries. I didn't have any knee injuries, elbow injuries, nothing like that, which I'm still fighting my back to this day with three bulging discs, pinch sciatic nerve, another nerve pinch. Anything you can say is wrong with your back. My back is wrong. So everything was fine and dandy, and I checked out. Little did I know that the biggest struggle I was going to deal with is my mental health which I started, as mentioned, self-medicating with alcohol. I didn't know there was such thing as a veteran community. I didn't know there was such thing as someone that would help you get your disability. And I didn't know that it wouldn't help hurt me from getting a job. In the military, you know, you're taught to be strong. You're taught to be not weak to go ask for help. If you ask for help, you're considered weak, and nobody wants anything to do with you because you're part of the weak crew. Little did I know mental health, going to ask for help makes you stronger. I met my wife. Oh, for, who's the Army? Who, is there a couple Army people? That's a real G.I. Joe, by the way, just saying. I met my beautiful wife, Allison, uh, near, near a very, very weak point in my life. I was just at a year sober, uh, being sober. And it was one of those things I said in our wedding vows that uh, I prayed Matthew 7, 7, a thousand and one times. Knock, the door shall open, seek, you shall find. And to me, that, well, that, that woman right there is, uh, was th that prayer being answered for me. The Bible says that the man is to be the head of the household, to, to, to show the walk. But she's the one that shows the walk every single day in my house. 
And she's blessed me with that beautiful little boy right there, Rex. And we're going through IVF right now, which we find out Friday. Hopefully, we have some embryos where we're able to do the transfer where we can have our second child. That woman has truly saved my life without question. She holds me accountable. She keeps me sober, which I don't know how she stays sober. She doesn't have uh, any dependency issues, but I'm not easy to deal with. So I'm, I'm sure she, she struggles. Uh, she likes drinking that little, that, you know, that fake champagne that people drink, that grapefruit? Yeah, I make sure that stays stock in the fridge for her. Uh, but but she, she has truly, truly saved my life. Before her, I went through three suicide attempts, like you just mentioned. Anyone know the Robin Williams story? I'm sure everybody in here knows Robin Williams. I had the Robin Williams uh, mentality. Everyone thought I was happy-go-lucky, would be in the bars. I was buying everything. I was making sure everyone was having a good time. Chances were, if you were next to me when I was drinking, you weren't going to remember the night, and we were going to have some fun. Uh, but as soon as I closed that door, I would fall down to the ground, I would pray to God, and my knees get weak just thinking about those moments every time. No one knew that I tested, tasted a uh, Weatherby shotgun barrel twice or went to drown myself another time. Like many of us, I'm sure uh, some people in here have guns in their house. I'd kept mine loaded, off safety, so if anything ever happened, it was time to go down. The first time, I don't know why, I only thing I can think of is, is to give it to God is my gun wasn't loaded. Pull the trigger, there was nothing in there. The second time, pull the trigger, for some reason it was on safety. And it was about a seven month gap between those. And the third time, I went to, to drown myself and somehow somebody found me. A friend drove by, didn't know what was happening, got out of his truck thinking I was having a beer down the water, by the water, but I was there with the center block ready to ready to, to go under and not come back up. On December 1st, 2000, 2016, I went to hang out with some people that I met in the, in the oil field and uh, went to have some alcohol. Well, that night I decided to be smart, ter, not really smart, but a little bit smarter than I was at the time, and uh, get closer to home before I end up getting drunk. End up driving back home, car pulled out in front of me, I swerved, lost control, hit another car. As we're sitting on the side of the road dealing with that wreck, another truck came and took out my three-quarter ton diesel with a Ford Ranger at 70 miles an hour. So the ones that understand what those vehicles are can understand it wasn't a very good match for, for the Ford Ranger. That moment, I knew I was going to jail. Cop came up to me. He said, sir, have you been drinking? I'm not going to lie to you. I've had seven beers today from noon until now, and it was about 740 at night. I refused everything. I have some equilibrium vertigo issues, so I knew I wasn't going to pass a sobriety test. Little did I know that they could wake up the judge and he could sign a warrant for you to get your blood drawn, which that happened, and my blood ended up being 0.23 that day. Uh, night before, I went out, got fully blacked out drunk, where I woke up to my truck door open in the driveway, and I drove. So I was that drunk where I couldn't even get out of my truck. As I was sitting in jail, I knew there was only one thing I can do, and that was to put the alcohol down. As I mentioned, my, my grandpa was my hero. I wanted to do everything just like him. Little did I know I was doing exactly everything that he did. He was an alcoholic, but I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know that until I got sober. So I was following his footsteps where my mom would have to drive him home from bars when she was 11 years old. My dad had to carry my grandpa into the house many a times when him and my mom met. Little did I know, I was being exactly like my grandfather. There's no Marines, so you know the Marines are part of the Department of the Navy, so I was being exactly like my grandfather. RDD 214 said the same branch. So I knew that, that my life needed to change. The only way my life could change is to be that change. So I vowed to God, like, you know, I ran to him, ran to him when things were bad. I vowed that if you get me out of this situation, I will not have another sip of alcohol and I will move forward. And I'm proud to say that from that moment, December 21st, 2016, I have not had one sip of alcohol. And I do that with the treatment center. Thank you.
I didn't go into a treatment, I didn't check myself in a treatment center, AA group or, or any of that. I saw, sought out some mentors, some people I wanted to be like. Out of all places, six months into it, I met my mentor in a bar. I know it's kind of odd, but we were sitting there talking about boots. He had a pair of ele elephant skin boots on. I had a pair of Parakuru, if anyone, it's those bass boots that people say look like pineapples. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Uh, so we were sitting there talking about those and he changed the conversation to a book called The Ant and the Elephant by Vincent uh, Pacenti, who I actually have now became friends with. That book talks about how your subconscious mind and your conscious mind need to work together. And he put into perspective when I just met him uh, two months ago now, that your subconscious mind and your conscious mind, the way the neurons are firing is your conscious mind is a golf ball sitting on top of the astrodome. Only amount of putting it into real life perspective, which I think is kind of mind blowing, no pun intended. Um, and that book changed my life. That's when I started going into, into mentorship. And, and the first year I read like 36 books, but I started to take everything from different authors and create my own path. From there, that led me to the veteran treatment court where I was a mentoring and wellness coordinator for Harris County and later on into Galveston County as well, where we saw 127 participants per year and we mentored them through, through their court process. Uh, I believe there's a court in Montgomery County, a veteran treatment court. Uh, so if you ever wanna look into that, that, that's a phenomenal program where you can go help mentor and assist the ones that are going through that court process. There's a lot of stigmas that are in the military. We'll start with the studies first. Per the VA, fewer than 50% of returning veterans in need receive any mental health treatment. More than two, to ten, two of 10 veterans with PTSD will have substance use disorder. 46% of individuals with lifetime PTSD also meet the criteria for SUD, which is substance use disorder. And according to First Liberty, 73% of active military identify as people of faith. Do you know that there is 70% of veterans that don't use the, use the VA, at least in at Michael D. Becky in Houston? So there's 70% of veterans that are out there that are dealing with those issues. Those stigmas that are around the veteran community is, oh, I need a drink to have fun, or the I, uh, veterans can only speak to veterans, or I served, so I'm entitled to that. That's one that sticks to me very, very hard. I'm gonna try not to sound too harsh. Our veterans need help. I'm not gonna argue that one, one bit at all. What I will argue is we need more helping hands than handouts. Given the handouts feed into that entitlement, things get lazy. I have somebody that's gonna help me when things are bad instead of me going out and doing the work. One thing that is one of those, uh, you give a man a fish or teach a man to fish, that is what I believe that is built around. We need more helping hands out there and not handouts. For me, it's mentorship. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, how successful you think you are. I do not believe anyone has done anything on their own. First, you need God. I think we can all agree on that. And two, you need somebody to chase. Even in the Bible, it says that you should chase one, run with one, and have one chase you. And I believe that's the way life should be. You should always find someone that can be your mentor. You can have someone run with you where you can grow together and then teach that person behind you. For change to happen, it has to happen in you, to your family, to your home, to your friends, to your community. Not one of us can go out there and think we're gonna change the world if we don't change with ourselves. And I'm living proof of that. If I would not have changed myself, I would not have been able to be here on this stage, my claim to fame, JP Lane, you know, being able to know him. Uh, I call, he calls me his sweat, little short, short, short story. He calls me his sweat rag buddy because every time I say he's going to go on stage, I'm going to have a little sweat rag. 
so everyone could see me on stage with them, so I can get a little bit of fame. Uh, but Crystal and Crystal and JP are some of my my dear friends, and they're the ones that if I need a prayer, I know they're gonna they're gonna pray for me. So we need to, we need to start helping out those ones below us and with us as well. We need to start at our home and go out and start blossoming in the world. Right now, I'm working with Harris County. Uh, don't let the the county fool you or or just steer you from from the assistance that we are able to provide. We just got a new grant from the VA because I know that stat that seventy percent of veterans aren't going to the VA. They realize that, so they have given some grant money out. My job is to go out to the surrounding counties that touch Harris County, which is Montgomery, uh, Waller, Galveston, Brazoria, Liberty, Chambers, and get to the VSOs or the people in the community to assist with suicide prevention. As you can probably tell, suicide is something that's very near and dear to my heart that I don't want anything to happen. There's that number out there that is 22 veterans a day. Wrong. That number is actually higher. That 22 number is the only ones that are in the VA system. That's not counting if they're homeless and not in the VA system. That's not if they're one of the 70% that doesn't use the VA system. That number is not counted. And it's the ones that are reported to the VA. So that number is actually a lot higher than, than 22 a day. So we're going out and we're finding veterans that have suicidal ideation that we measure off the Columbia scale. And if there's something that has caused them to have suicidal ideation, such as a single mom th that's possibly a veteran and she needs some help because she can't get a job because she's the only one that cares for her kids, can't afford childcare, to go get that job interview, to go to the VA, to get that mental health assistance that she needs, we're able to come in and provide support for her to be able to go with her life, move forward with her life, to give that helping hand. We're not saying, hey, here's that money, then just go shopping. No, we're paying the third party, and she has to go out and, and get the help. We will monitor her through the whole process and after. A lot of, a lot of people will, will give you that handout, and then just go about, go about the business. We're going to monitor and make sure that they reintegrate into society uh, and help improve their lives. So we are servicing all the counties in this area as well. Does anyone have any questions for me thus far? Harris County Veterans Service Department. Yeah, so we're actually for Harris County. Any other questions thus far? Not even one? Not even my shoe size? Nobody wants to buy me a pair of shoes? So I did skip over my job, and I'll tell you that where my mental health comes from. So as it, as it was mentioned, I was an aircraft firefighter on the USS John C. Sinus. Our job was pretty much anything that you would see at the Hobby Airport. Uh, anything would happen with nose wheel failures, fuel spills, people hit their heads, which I don't know how you hit your head on a plane when you're walking to a plane. I mean, if you miss, you can't see the plane, we might need to go check you for, for your eyesight. Uh, so if they hit their head, we would deal with that, fuel spills. Uh, Mr. Marshall fly in. We had to deal with him a few times. Just kidding. I think you were before me. Uh, but it was great talking to him about some of the aircrafts we dealt with because we dealt with some Vietnam aircraft. Uh, we had a, a real bad fire. Uh, 2011, we ended up having a, to medevac five out, and we had 10 on board that, that were injured pretty bad by a Marine bird of all, all those things. And we also lost a guy pulling into port. Um, that's where the survivor guilt came from. That guy was very loved on the boat and anyone that he touched. And it was just one of those things like, why, why him? When I was out there getting drunk, wanting to have the party, uh, but not dealing with my issues and whatnot. Uh, the, the walk with Jesus. As I mentioned with, with my wife, I'm not going to put her back on screen because I'll start crying again. Um, we met girlfriend, out of all things. The, uh, the only th person that ever saw any of my suicide was that ex-girlfriend. She was in the room for one of them. She didn't know where I was at life, didn't know what I was going through, but she said that they were praying for more guys to come to her small group, and she thought I'd be a perfect fit. She didn't know I got sober. She didn't know anything. So I was like, you know what? I'll give it a shot. So I went down there, and that's when my, 
my wife walked in the room and I instantly knew that that was the, the girl that I wanted to be with. It was one of those like Hallmark movie style things. Yeah, I'll watch Hallmark, don't judge me. Uh, and I, I knew she was the one. The only issue with that small group was we had some people in there that could speak Hebrew and they were a little bit above our, our knowledge. So we decided to meet up and have our own Bible study before, before church. So we got to start out as friends and then best friends and then, and then to, to be together, and now we're married. Uh, but we, we would meet, and we, we would talk about God. We, we would talk about what we were learning. Uh, I n- never had a girl friend, not in relationship, but a girl friend, uh, th- that was devoted to her faith like she was. She didn't cuss. She didn't drink. I used to drink like a sailor, and when we met, she didn't know it, but I still cussed it like a sailor. But she made me, made me watch, watch my language. Uh, she was everything that I could dream of. Um, I don't know how I got so lucky. I think it's one of those God things for sure. That, that's, that's who I needed in my life. So we'd meet about, and then we'd walk into a small group, and we'd feel smart again. Like We knew what they were talking about because we had our own little session. So we could like key in and say these little things. Uh, but she, she, she's definitely the one that keeps me on on my walk. If it wasn't for her, I, I honestly would be back drinking again. And I would probably be back down the suicide trail in jail doing something I don't want to do. So men, are there any single men in here? Oh, you got to go to church, find you a woman. I <laughs> promise you. Did, did anyone else meet their spouse in church in here? Sue? He knows what I'm talking about. Uh, so as much as I, I, I strive to be that, that man of the house of, of walking, I'm not going to lie to you and, and shoot smoke. I, I struggle daily, but that's what groups like this is for, to find friends that, that walk that walk with you and be surrounded by good people. I appreciate you. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for allowing me to be here, and I hope this helped somebody in one way, shape, or form. And uh, if y'all have any questions, I can stick around up here. I will not dance, uh, and I will not sing. Last time I sung, the water in the shower turned off, so the water doesn't even want to hear me sing. Uh, but I will answer any questions, or I'll be over here if, if y'all have anything else. Yeah, but see, if he says that he wasn't supposed to talk, but that little hole he has, it helps him sing. I didn't get that little hole. And he's missing a finger, so he's able to move better. <laughs> there are those organizations that do help find jobs and they do do employment. The problem is, is connecting those veterans before they get out. Uh, there's some people that are starting to, to go into those transition classes, but the military does way too good of a job to train us while we're in and train us up, but they do a crummy job bringing us back to civilian life. I mean, we have our parents tell us how to dress and what to wear, what to eat, where to, when to wake up for school. We go in the service, we get that, and we get out, then we, we're kind of lost. Uh, but there's no one that connects directly before they leave. The officers have, a lot better, have it a lot better. They get a little bit better of a transition than the list it does, but they usually do more, more time than we do. But there are plenty of organizations that, that will help with jobs. Say that one more time. I did get, I did get sick, uh, sent to a sex, drug, and alcohol class one time. When I showed up, I showed up, work to drunk. I showed up to work drunk. No, I have not been drinking today, people. Uh, and that class is actually the reason why I didn't go to AA classes or to treatment, because that one class made me want to, as soon as I left that class every day, I went and had a drink, because it was just stressing me out. So and that, that class kind of assisted me in my recovery journey, but at that time, it wasn't like a, it was more of a slap on the wrist type of thing.
And, and that's why I was saying, like, the stigma about, you know, the, the military culture on drinking. I mean, you see it, every photo you see in the military, there's some type of drinking involved in it. And, I mean, there's nothing, uh, there's a Dr. Uh, McCauley. He is a, uh, he ended up going to Leavenworth. He was a uh, um, flight doctor. Did, and, uh, yeah. And he ended up having shoulder surgery, ended up getting addicted to opioids and, and was stealing them from the pharmacy and ended up going to Leavenworth. He calls it the Harvard of prisons. Uh, but he, he, he mentions that there's nothing we can do about alcohol. It's already illegal. Uh, and that's, he, he was talking about uh, legalizing marijuana, about what it does before you're 25 uh, to your brain. So I think since the military has that culture of, it's legal here, so when we go over there, we can start drinking at an even earlier age, which is, is gonna cause more, more damage to the brain than, than at least waiting until you're 21. Uh, I, I would say for one, um, like like how I mentioned about the the child, how we're able to pay for the child care. We're going to stay with that to that for that individual to make sure that they're doing their side of of the the agreement. Hey, we'll help pay for that child care, but we need you to go get that job, go get that mental health to help stabilize you. Uh, there's a lot of organizations that are out there to give financial assistance or or whatnot. But there's no continuing. Like a lot, there's a lot of veterans that are on fixed income. They know what they're getting, but they don't have uh, a financial plan or a financial assistance program to help them. Hey, I'm getting X amount of money. This is what I can afford. This is what I need to keep to the side and, and keep moving forward. Uh, there's an organization called Impact to Hero that does do a financial assistance or a financial program that is uh, built around Dave Ramsey. Uh, and that's a good organization, but you keep giving, if you see someone, I mean, yeah, people do need help, uh, handouts at times. I will not argue that point. But when you have repeat offenders and repeat, 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 and repeat, and repeat, and repeat, and repeat, then are you solving the problem, or are you just assisting with the problem? Anybody else? Well, I appreciate it. I hope you all have a, a, a very blessed day, and I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. It was awesome. Appreciate that. And uh, we have, uh, before he sneaks out, again, David Fry is going to be our speaker next month. And uh, I know he's going to have a great story to tell us. And because uh, we all remember Jack Fry, David's dad, and uh, you know, started a Christian business luncheon many years ago. And uh, he's a great friend to a lot of us. So everybody stay safe. We'll see you back here next month, right here. And it's back to the second Tuesday. Thank you. And until we meet again, until we